Um, I would like to welcome Sister Chandasiri, who will be leading tonight's class, and who I believe is in Amravati, or? That's right. Yeah. Welcome, thank you. So good evening, everybody. Feels like quite a long time since uh, I took part in a Buddhist society class, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm actually in the shrine room here at Amaravati Monastery. Some of you may recognize the shrine behind me. And uh, there's nobody else here, just me and my iPad on a little stand, the clock in front of me and, and the gong. So um, what you people usually say a little bit about me, I just so that you know who I am, I was one of the uh, very early nuns to be ordained by Ajahn Sumedho at Chithurst in 1979 just shortly after the monastery was opened. And I've been a nun ever since, um, living first at Chithurst and at Amarawati and over the years between the two monasteries until about 10 years ago, I um, established a small hermitage in Scotland for nuns of our tradition. Uh, but for this, this year, I've been spending most of my time, almost all the time here at Amarawati, just supporting the community here because uh, after several nuns left unexpectedly, uh, the community was quite small. So that's why I'm here. I'm here for the Vasa, and then towards the end of October, I'll be returning to Miltium in Scotland. So we'll follow the usual kind of format for the evening, um, beginning with a, a short puja, and uh, we'll have a screen share. You'll notice it's the morning chanting we'll be doing. Uh, don't be surprised by this. It's almost the same as the evening chanting, but it, it works a little bit better, um, I find, to do the, the morning chanting. Um, we'll chant in English so that you know what it is that we're chanting. And to start off with, I'll turn to the shrine and I'll light the candles. Whoops, I lost my sound, I think. I think. Oh, maybe not. Um, so. I'll light the candles and the incense, offer the incense uh, to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And then we'll, we'll do the chanting. You're welcome to join in if you know the chanting or if you like to follow on the screen. And if you prefer just to listen, of course, that's, that's completely fine. To the Blessed One, the Lord, who fully attained perfect enlightenment, to the teaching which he expounded so well, and to the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, to these the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, we render with offerings our rightful homage. It is well for us that the Blessed One, having attained liberation, 
still had compassion for later generations. May these simple offerings be accepted for her long-lasting benefit and for the happiness it gives us. The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teachings so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the Sangha. Now let us pay our preliminary homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the Blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the Blessed, noble and Perfectly enlightened one. Now let us chant and praise of the Buddha. The Tathagata is the pure one, the perfectly enlightened one. He is impeccable in conduct and understanding. Be her accomplished one, the door of the world. He trains perfectly those who wish to be trained. He is teacher of gods and humans. He is awake and holy. In this world with its gods, demons and kind spirits, its seekers and sages, celestial and human beings. He has by deep insight revealed the truth. He has pointed out the Dhamma, beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. He has explained the spiritual life of complete purity, in its essence and conventions, I chant my praise to the Blessed One. I bow my head to the Blessed One. Now let us chant in praise of the Dhamma. The Dhamma is well expanded by the Blessed One. Apparent here and now, kindness, encouraging investigation, leading in words to be experienced individually by the wise. I chant my praise to this teaching. I bow my head to this truth. Now let us chant in praise of the Sangha. They are the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, who have practiced directly, who have practiced insightfully, those who practice with integrity. That is the four pairs, the eight kinds of noble being. These are the Blessed One's disciples. Such ones are worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect. They give occasion for incomparable goodness to arise in the world. I chant my praise to this Sankha. I bow my head to this Sankha.
So the uh, recollecting, paying homage to the Triple Gem, to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. What we generally do next is to uh, give the opportunity for those of you who would like to, uh, to determine the three refuges and the five precepts. And Imogen will, will make the formal request on behalf of everybody and uh, as with the Pooja, you're welcome to join in uh, chanting along, um, or if you prefer for this time, just to, just to watch and listen. That also is perfectly fine. So she can make the request and then I'll say a little bit about them for those of you who are new to this. Maya Maiti Saranena Saha Anja Silani Achama Dutiam be my am I to Saranena Saha Anja Silani Achama Tatiam be my am I to Saranena Saha Anja Silani Achama So Imogen has made the um, traditional request in the Pali language. Uh, for this, uh, the three refuges and the five precepts, this kind of structure, the structure for our practice within this tradition. The three refuges, refuge in the Buddha, uh, the, the awakened one, um, our own capacity for awakening, uh, for seeing things clearly uh, in an undiluted, unconfused way. Uh, the Dhamma, or the truth, uh, which we can experience directly, but only when we're fully present. So it's, it's like a, we, we, we go to the heart and we establish presence there. And that's where we can taste the Dhamma, the truth, something that everybody uh, can taste, can experience directly. Also, it refers to the teachings which uh, support us in um, attending, focusing our awareness uh, with where the truth is to be found with, in the present moment. So all of the teachings uh, show us where to look, um, how to attune to the Dhamma. Um, there's a, a lot that has been said about the Dhamma, many volumes uh, in all the libraries, lots and lots of books. Uh, with, with the um, actual teachings that the Buddha gave, all of them pointing to this very simple reality that we can experience here and now, which is beyond words. The third refuge is the refuge in Sangha, uh, the community, all of us here who are practicing together, the monastic communities, the people who've made a very strong commitment to uh, living according to the teachings as best they can and also our own aspiration to live in accordance with these teachings, uh, to do what we, we know to be right, and good and helpful, supportive, and to avoid as far as possible doing things that are harmful. And this brings us to the precepts, which are the simple ethical guidelines, uh, things to, to not do, <laughs> to refrain from doing, um, which again are a support, are reminders for us in our daily lives. So firstly, not to cause harm to any living being, not to destroy living any living creature, not to take what hasn't been given, to refrain from sexual misconduct, uh, false and harmful speech or lying, and to refrain from the use of intoxicants that cloud the mind and distort our perception, distort our judgment and make it impossible to keep the other precepts in any uh, real way. So um, what I'll do is I'll recite Namo Tassa three times and then Imogen will recite it three times and you're welcome to join in wherever you are. 
and then we'll go through the other, um, the refugees and the precepts line by line. Uh, the precepts will be in Pali and also I'll repeat it in English so you really know what it is that you're undertaking. And I encourage you all to do this because it's, uh, it's, it helps to anchor these very wonderful refuges and precepts. It helps to anchor them in the heart to make it a reality for us, something that we can really use in our lives. So, <clears throat> Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranam gachami. Buddhang saranam gachami. Dhammang saranam gachami. Dhammang saranam gachami. Sanghang saranam gachami. Sanghang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi buddham saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi sankham saranam gachami. Dutiyam pi sankham saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi buddham saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi buddham saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammam saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sankham saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sankham saranam gachami. Ti saranat kamana nititang. Tama ay. Panati Pata, where of money, see copper tongue, somebody hummy. Panati Pata, where of money, see copper tongue, somebody I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana, where of money, see copper dung, some muddy hummy. Adina dana, where of money, see copper dung, some I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara, where of money, si kapadang samadi hami. Kame sumi chachara, where of money, si kapadang samadi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musa wada, where of money, si kapadang samadi hami. Musa wada, where of money, si kapadang samadi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura miraya, majapamadatana, where of money, si kapadang samadi hami. Sura miraya, majapamadatana, where of money, si kapadang samadi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. 
Imani pancha si kapatani si lena suga tingyanti si lena boga sampada si lena nebu tingyanti tazamasi langwi sotaye. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So we've uh, renewed our intention, our commitment to living according to these simple ethical guidelines that can support us in our lives and support us in our practice of meditation. Uh, what they do is they uh, support us in having a sense of self-respect, uh, a sense of our own dignity and value, and they um, uh, reduce the amount of regret or remorse uh, that we are likely to experience in our lives. Uh, you know, if we do something cruel or harmful, take advantage of somebody, uh, uh, cheat in some way, uh, when we come to sit down and try to calm the mind, the chances are that the mind is not going to settle very easily. These things can, can, can trouble us. Whereas when we really make an effort to avoid causing harm uh, to ourselves or to others, uh, the result is a, is a calm and happy mind. We just feel glad about our lives with a sense of self-respect and gladness. So they, they can seem very, very simple. Um, they're not all that easy to keep. When we actually look into them, we can sometimes find ourselves in oh dear, not sure about that, particularly around speech, because speech is so habitual, it just comes tumbling out. We say things without really considering very often. And sometimes the things we say can be quite harmful. So uh, learning how to be careful around how we, how we act and speak. And this brings us to our meditation. Um, everything we do arises from the mind, is the intention there. And meditation can support us in uh, understanding or um, learning how to be clearer um, about our intentions, learning how to be aware of our thinking, uh, learning how to uh, notice when we're not fully present and how to reestablish presence. So I always think of meditation as being um, a training for the mind, you know, training, guiding, supporting the mind in being present. Very, very simple idea, uh, but for the many of you who've been practicing for maybe many years, uh, you'll understand that it's not, it's not always as simple and easy to do because the habits of the mind are very strong uh, habits of not being present are very strong and also because the mind is very impressionable. So those of you living in London, if you've had to go to work or had family uh, concerns, doing things with your family or uh, just engaging with different people, different situations and maybe some quite challenging situations, maybe unpleasant encounters, difficult, difficult things that you've had to uh, be exposed to. Um, the chances are that they're going to, that they'll, they'll have left a, a kind of imprint on the mind. And when we first sit to meditate, um, they'll, they'll come back. You know, you'll, you'll just remember these, you know, there'll be little snatches of memories and snatches of conversations and you know, maybe a little bit of internal commentary or judgment about things that have happened. And this is, this is the sort of normal end of the day chatter. <laughs> So please don't feel discouraged if the mind doesn't go completely silent, completely quiet, if you're not able to be with every breath, as I, as I describe, as I guide us in the meditation. You know, it may be that your mind will be kind of hijacked by these um, more compelling uh, concerns of your, of your daily life. So what I always encourage is to try to, as far as possible, stay with the meditation object, 
and this evening we'll focus mostly on the breath. Um, so to try to stay with that and just leave, leave the thoughts, leave the concerns to one side. You know, they may kind of chatter away, but try to, to keep, keep with the present. Don't allow yourself to be pulled back into a memory of something that has happened or pulled into the future, something that might happen. You know, some concern or worry about what might happen tomorrow or next week or maybe something you're looking forward to, something exciting, pleasant that you're anticipating. Um, all the time in our meditation, the intention is to be present. So I'll keep reminding you as we go along. So with meditation, and particularly the end of the day meditation, we need to take care in establishing um, a suitable supportive posture. Um, if you're sitting on the floor, as I am, then you might find sitting cross-legged a good position. Um, and I'm going to change to cross-legged posture right now. Um, but if, you're, you know, if your knees are a bit stiff, or your hips are stiff, then uh, you can kneel using a meditation bench. Um, or you may prefer, you may find that it's easier just to sit in a chair. Um, it really doesn't matter. And I also like to say that, you know, if any of you are unwell and if you need to be lying down, if you're in bed, not, not very well, then you can still meditate. Um, but you need to be particularly vigilant because the lying down posture is actually the most difficult because it's so easy to fall asleep, you know, particularly if you're very comfortable. <laughs> so uh, what we want to do is to be awake, to be awake, to be alert, attentive. And by now, probably many of you are feeling a little bit sleepy after a long day. So this is where we need to really take time to try to sit up nice and straight. Um, I usually say that, you know, sit in a position so that if you're looking, if, you're, if your eyes are open, you're looking straight ahead. Um, you can also experiment with just touching the crown of your head, touching the top of your head, and just imagining that you're kind of pushing upwards, almost like holding up the ceiling a support for the ceiling. And that, that'll, that'll help you to find a nice um, aligned position. It's almost like a, a column of, of energy uh, coming down through the crown of the head and through the body, through the spine, into the earth. That can be a helpful uh, reminder as well. I usually like to close my eyes, but if you're very, very sleepy, then opening the eyes is good sitting with the eyes wide open. So there's the impression of light coming into the mind. But if you're not too sleepy, then you can gently close the eyes. And we begin just by bringing the awareness into the body, you know, fully into the body. You know, there'll be thinking happening up here in the head, but we, we choose to, to be in the body. Uh, this is aware of our contact with the chair or the floor or the cushion. Just really bring awareness to, to that feeling of pressure out of the head and into the uh, different areas of the body that we can uh, be aware of. Bring the consciousness into the body. So conscious of the pressure as we sit, conscious of the trunk of the body rising up from the base with the head perched on the top, and the neck and the shoulders relaxed, allow the shoulders to drop slightly, relax the head and the face. Sometimes I encourage people to imagine that they can breathe through the muscles, just directing the breath energy through the muscles, <clears throat> just to release tension, like a very gentle shower, just washing through with the out breath, breathing away any feeling of tension or tightness. But particularly around the face, this is an area where we're often quite tense, particularly around the forehead and the eyes. So taking a little time to breathe through the face, 
the muscles of the face. Allow the face to soften, to relax. Allow the shoulders to drop. Feel the heaviness of the arms and the hands resting on the knees or in the lap, however comfortable for you. Releasing any feeling of tightness or constriction around the heart, breathing through the heart center, allowing a softening and opening of the heart. Moving down into the solar plexus, the middle part of the body, and just noticing how that is right now. Maybe slightly agitated, tense, tight. See if you can use the breath to calm and settle in the solar plexus area. Now breathe down into the belly. Taking a long, slow inhalation. When you can't breathe in anymore, a long, slow, easy exhalation. And when it's time to breathe in again, another long, slow, easy inhalation. Using this deep belly breathing to really bring a sense of ease and well being. Calming, settling. We breathe down through the legs muscles of the thighs, around the knees, calves, ankles, feet. And finally, attending to the spine, releasing tension from around the spine beginning at the base of the skull, working gently down through the neck area, releasing tension from the muscles around the vertebrae in the neck, down into the shoulder area, the back of the shoulders, the back of the rib cage, back of the waist, right down into the base of the spine. So you can almost visualize this extraordinary column of interlocking bones that support the entire bodily upright posture. Only now we're sitting without any extra strain or tension, nicely poised, balanced, alert and attentive. Maintaining our awareness of the body breathing, the sensation of breathing, the in-breath from beginning to end as it's happening. The point of change from in-breath to out-breath and the out breath from beginning to end. So 
If you find it helpful, you can use a word or a short phrase as an additional support, a reminder. Sometimes even something so simple as breathing in, breathing out, or here, as you breathe in, now, as you breathe out, or bud, as you breathe in, do, as you breathe out. You can choose any word or phrase that can be an additional support. Or if you prefer, you can simply rest calmly with the breath, enjoying the sensations of the body breathing, leaving any thoughts to one side, really being here now with this breath as we experience it. You make the breath the most important thing to be attending to. Our anchor, our friend, holding the awareness with Dhamma, with this moment. Dhamma, the truth that we can experience, that we can taste when we're fully present. This precious refuge. Here, now. Keeping the face soft. Noticing when there's tension in the forehead or around the eyes. Gently releasing that. Softening the face. Breathing gently, calmly. Enjoying the breath, the sensation of the body breathing.
you suddenly notice that you're not with the breath anymore, that the mind has been hijacked by some interesting thought about the past or about the future, simply notice that, acknowledge it, come back, come back. back to the breath, again and again and again, gently guiding, supporting the mind to attend to the breath, to this moment, here, now. Turning aside from interesting thoughts about the future or about the past, just leaving them to go their own way, finding pleasure in just this breath, just this moment. If you find the mind becoming a little bit drifty, dreamy, dozy, then open your eyes. Sit up nice and straight. Just really stay attentive and alert. If at the other extreme you find you're getting very tense, and agitated, with too much effort, then it can be helpful just to focus a little bit more on the out-breath, the calm, relaxing out-breath. Just keeping it all rather simple. It's not a, not a competition with ourselves or with anybody else. Just a simple exercise that we're doing together. Learning how to be present. One breath at a time.
the last part of the meditation, I encourage you to bring up thoughts of kindliness, friendliness towards yourself. May this being be well. May this being be freed from every kind of suffering. May this being know perfect ease. Or just, may I be well. Find a word or a phrase that is meaningful to you. Easy, encouraging, supportive. And if you like, you can extend this energy of kindness beyond your own form into the space around you, people you're living with, your dear ones, wherever they are, good friends, colleagues, Anybody you have difficulty with, just the thought, may they be well, may they be at ease. Anybody you know who's sick or suffering from some kind of mental anguish, bereavement, worry, difficulty, loss, People in situations of conflict, close by, or far afield, war zones, domestic violence, other kinds of difficulties, unrest. the people with great power, great responsibility, the rulers, the politicians, even though we may strongly disagree with their, with what they do, what they say, we can still wish them well. May they be well, may they know inner ease, may they touch in to that wisdom, that compassion of the heart to enable them to fulfill their responsibilities, to use their wealth for the welfare of all. And extending over the entire planet, the whole ecosystem struggling so much right now kinds of imbalance, the animals, the plants, the atmosphere, the waters, the mountains. May our planet be well. May it find balance. And extending out into the universe, 
May all beings everywhere, seen and unseen, near and far, be well, free from every kind of suffering, every kind of dukkha. And little by little, we come back into our bodies, come back into the heart, sitting here, calmly breathing, here, now, may this being be well. some lights on. So sometimes we can feel very um, discouraged, really, particularly those of you who um, are exposed to the media, to the news, newspapers, TV, uh, internet, you know, there are all kinds of uh, alarming, concerning things happening, you know, both kind of locally and uh, much further afield. And then the whole turbulence of, of the climate situation, the uh, imbalances in the planet and the creatures becoming extinct and, and just very alarming things that we hear about. Uh, and I'm fortunate I live in a monastery and we don't, we don't watch TV and we don't have newspapers. And so I, I'm less uh, exposed to these things, but I, I do know that they're happening. People tell us and every now and again I read something and uh, it, there are these inescapable, uh, alarming uh, circumstances of our lives. And we can feel quite hopeless, uh, quite impotent uh, in the face of this. And we can you know, wonder what our Buddhist practice can really do to make a difference. And like, the meditation that I've just guided us in might seem uh, like wishful thinking rather than anything that can have much of a real impact. Uh, on the conditions around us. Um, and perhaps it doesn't have any impact on the conditions around us. Maybe, maybe that's, that's true. Uh, but what we can notice is the effect on our own hearts. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I find a sense of gladness um, when I uh, bring up this attitude of, of kindness, of well-wishing. Uh, you know, when I actually allow myself to uh, have a, an attitude of kindliness towards this one. Uh, and so often we can be very harsh and critical in our judgments of this. It's almost like a kind of a project. You know, we have to make this, make this thing into something perfect according to our ideal. 
That's, that's kind of the way that some, some of us have been conditioned, that we have to be perfect, super perfect. I was talking yesterday uh, in a talk I gave about a woman that I know who got 98, 97% in an exam when she was a, a child. And her mother said to her, what about the other 3%? not able to celebrate uh, the goodness, the beauty, the, the wonder of having done so incredibly well and instead focusing on where this person had failed. And we all do that, or many of us do that in different ways. And what I'd like to encourage is that we um, maybe stop doing that. Not that we uh, fall into a sense of complacency. Oh, well, I'm, I'm perfect already. I'm good enough. Um, don't need to do anything. I do what I like. Um, don't care. Uh, we do care. And uh, we do. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I would like to contribute in a positive way uh, to, our, uh, to our world. Um, you know, whatever way I can. Um, So learning how to actually celebrate our goodness, to focus on that as a way of, of brightening the mind, of gladdening the mind. There are far too many glum, miserable, confused, um, very confused people in the world. And if we can just... Uh, develop a little, a little gladness, a little joy in our lives. Uh, that's already a very significant contribution. If we can cultivate mindfulness, the capacity to stay present, rather than the mind spinning off into you know, what might happen or what has happened and um, getting into a lot of blaming and judging and uh, criticism of people. You know, we can feel the shock if we hear something shocking. We can feel the shock. We can allow the shock uh, to, to be there. But when we're mindful, we're actually creating a peaceful space around the shock. And this can support a settling, an inner settling, a coming into balance. When we're mindful, then rather than simply reacting with a sense of vindictiveness, blaming, violence, you know, violent judgments and criticisms and lashing out um, either verbally or physically uh, towards those who've harmed us or who might harm us. When we can just establish presence, we can respond in a much more appropriate way to what is happening or what we've heard about. It may be that something very um, terrible has happened, that someone has done some terrible thing. But when we really allow ourselves to, to be present with that, what can arise is a sense of compassion, um, a sense of compassion for those who've been adversely affected by such an event, um, a sense of compassion for those who have perpetrated, who've done something really terrible. Because as we know from the Buddha's teachings, nobody gets away with anything. You know, if we do something uh, with an attitude of um, ill will, cruelty, greed, hatred, aversion, and if we act um, in these ways, with, with, with these kind of intentions, then we're going, to, we're going to suffer. There's going to be a result. Maybe straight away we feel, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that. Those are the lucky ones who feel that straight away, strangely enough. Because when we feel that straight away, there's a sense of a hiriotopa, a sense of, oh dear, I shouldn't have done that. That's, very, that's a very wholesome state. That's one of the guardians of the world. Hiri, Otapa, they're called the guardians of the world. Um, shame, I wish I hadn't done that. That 
wasn't a skillful action. That wasn't a skillful way to speak. Otapa, and I really don't want to do that again. I really want to avoid causing harm to myself or to others. If we can bring forth a sense of compassion, a sense of kindliness, a sense of forgiveness, a generosity of heart, these are qualities that support well-being, that support gladness. And just as ill will is, in, is, is the Buddha likens ill will to a disease, and it can be a very infectious disease, that sort of, uh, like the, 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 the realm of gossip and slander and um, uh, divisive uh, ways of speaking can easily spread like wildfire. Everybody can get enraged in a very short space of time. That's like an infectious disease, a terrible um, fever that, that spreads the fire, the fire of ill will. In the same way, the fire of, or the, I guess it's not so much likened to a fire, but kindness, uh, compassion, uh, gentleness, uh, generosity of heart, these also can affect others in a very positive way. And people can see the joy that arises from these things. This is kind of like an infectious, very beautiful kind of infection. So it's always very interesting, like in our monasteries, when we have a, a festival day, an almsgiving festival, when uh, many, many people come together. And Asians have a, a very beautiful way of, of, of doing things. You know, rather than being all bashful about their generosity and not really wanting to, anybody else to know about it, which is, a, I think, a, can be a, a, like a, a Western uh, trait, um, perhaps from, from Christianity, and, uh, just not, 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 uh, not really telling people if we've done something good. Uh, Asian people are much more ready to, to let people know and to invite people to share in the, the blessings that can, can arise from a, from a generous good action. And so our festival days are always very joyful and people come and they, they make extraordinarily generous contributions. You know, they, bring, they feed everybody. They, you know, people bring food for hundreds of people and they, they make extraordinarily generous offerings to, to the monasteries. Um, and you know, quite often people who maybe don't have very much money, but they, 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 they're brought up to share what they have. And a lot of joy comes from that. And uh, you know, if, if we watch, then, then it can catch on and other people begin to, to, um, to do the same thing. <clears throat> you know, obviously, uh, we need to be careful that we don't, <laughs> we don't give all our money away. Um, but you know, to, to, to have, have a, uh, that it's done with, uh, with wisdom, you know, uh, not, 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 not foolishness. Um, so the Buddha also gives advice about how to, how to use our wealth. I was quite surprised when I first came across this because um, you know, the Buddha would talk about something so worldly, but there's a whole, a whole sutta in the Diganikaya that some of you may be familiar with, the Sigalaka, Sigalaka Sutta, where he actually you know, talks about the different responsibilities you know, of parents to children and children to parents and husband to wife and wife to husband and employer to employee and employee to employer and so on. But then there's another section about how to, how to use your wealth. And, you know, that it's okay to keep some of it. You know, it's okay to invest some of it. You know, if you have a business, you invest some of it in the business. Uh, you keep some of it to, to do, you know, what what you know what what you like to like to, to give gifts and to, to support your family, and uh, and then you give some away. Uh, and I can't actually remember, to be honest, exactly what the the, the way it was apportioned 
But I was interested that it wasn't that you had to give everything away, but you, 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 you reflect on, on your situation and what, what you need you know, for, your, for your life, for your family, pay the bills and so on. And then, you know, you, if, if, if you have more than you need, then you, you know, give it away. Um, but you don't have to give all of it away. So, you know, you, you choose and just notice uh, the joy the pleasure that comes from sharing what you have. It may be just a very simple thing. Maybe you've got a cake and you decide to give half of it to your friend. You know, if you're having a coffee break with someone. Um, well, when I have my meal, when I'm on retreat, I, I give some, some of the food that's in my bowl. I share it with the, with the creatures that, I'm, you know, that live in the space near my kuti, wherever I'm staying. And this, this brings a sense of happiness. So looking at ways that we can, we can brighten the mind and bring a sense of gladness and blessing to those around us. And not to underestimate the power of mindfulness and not to underestimate the significance of keeping precepts. You know, being somebody in the society who, who is upright, you know, who doesn't cheat, who doesn't lie, who doesn't steal, who doesn't cause harm to others either through speech or any kind of violent action. This again is a kind of example to, to, to others. And you're not always going to get it right, but just the fact that you're, you're even trying is, is a wholesome and uplifting quality. And little by little, as you become more mindful and as you become more aware of your capacity, there may be other things that you can do that can have an influence. Uh, you know, I don't know what those things might be. You know, some of you can write, some of you can are good speakers, some of you make films, documentaries, uh, some of you, you know, organize groups of people to do, I don't know, voluntary work of one kind or another. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lady who lives just down the road who makes it her business. Like every day she goes out for a walk, she has a plastic bag, and she has one of those sticks for picking things up. And she just goes and she, she just picks up litter. And you'd be surprised how much litter there is in the lanes, the country lanes around Amarawati. It's, it's quite shocking. And every day she comes home with a big bag of litter. And uh, I expect she sorts it out into things for recycling and then other things, general rubbish and so on. And that's just what she does. And... Uh, you know, if people do that, then that can encourage other people to do something similar. So there are many ways that we can bring about change. Many reasons for not allowing ourselves to tumble into a sense of fear or discouragement. We keep the mind bright and know that there are countless men and women all over the planet who are doing really, really good things and that we can follow their example. So I'm aware I've spoken rather longer than I intended to, but these are just a few ideas that you might like to bring into your lives, into your practice. And um, I think now we can have a little bit of time if there are any questions. And you can either um, raise your virtual hand or your actual hand, or if you prefer to send a chat message uh, to the host who will send it to Imogen and she'll read it out. So we have about 15, 20 minutes for some questions that I can respond to. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and are there any questions? They can be um, very ordinary questions. They don't have to be you know, super, super questions. Uh, but you may prefer just to sit quietly. That's fine too.
I just uh, <clears throat> wanted to thank you for a beautiful talk. Uh, very difficult to find a question because so much of it is just seeping through and uh, settling. So please don't un uh, understand the silence is non-interest. I think it's a question of digesting. Uh, yeah. It was a beautiful teacher shared with us this evening, so thank you. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, yeah, sometimes we just need to let things settle. I often say that a very good mind, way to make the mind go quiet is to say, are there any questions? <laughs> I would agree with um, what Nick just said. And it's... Um, what I would like to say is I'm a very keen gardener and um, there's a conflict in gardening and let's say at Amaravati where other people do the gardening but not the monks and nuns and could you perhaps talk a little bit about it? Yes, I could. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, the monks can do some gardening. They can rake leaves and they can move soil around if it's already been dug. Um, in fact, a couple of days ago, a huge truckload of top quality, no, high quality topsoil arrived. One of the monks called it dirt, but the nun corrected him and said, no, it's high quality topsoil that had to be moved from one place and spread around. And the monks could help with that. Uh, basically, the monks have a rule that they, they can't damage plant life and they can't dig the earth, um, which certainly limits their um, activities in the garden. The nuns don't have that rule. Uh, there are some of the nuns and Anagari Khas who really prefer not to do weeding or digging. Um, and we allow them the space to not do it if they really feel uncomfortable doing it. Um, it's basically about disturbing other creatures. And um, it's something that I find um, I ponder, so far, I, I mean, I, I love gardening too, actually, to be completely honest, but I am aware that creatures are harmed. Um, I'm also very conscious that I don't do it deliberately. I don't deliberately cause harm to creatures, that sometimes an animal is harmed by my, you know, when I, when I uh, say dig or, or do weeding or something like that. And certainly the plants are harmed. Um, like the weed, what we call weeds. Um, I'm also aware that uh, if you have a garden, it's something that can bring a lot of joy. It's like a way, a way of kind of, um, and you can actually plant things that encourage certain insects, like some of the plants actually encourage bees and, and butterflies and other insects. And, you know, that, that's, I would see that as a good thing. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of questions about it. I think as far as possible, I mean, I think there are ways of gardening in a way that's less harmful. Um, and I would really encourage people to, to find out about those, those uh, strategies, you know, particularly if you're growing vegetables. You know, I, there can be, I mean, I, I've never grown vegetables. I tried one time growing lettuces in a little patch I had in Oxford and I, they were coming up beautifully. And then one day I went out and there were just a lot of very fat, happy slugs and no lettuces. And that was a bit difficult for me, I have to say. <laughs> but I'm told that there are ways of planting that um, discourage uh, these creatures and maybe have an area you know, a wild area where, where um, those kind of animals can find the food that they need to survive. 
because it's really important that we um, support, you know, all kinds of animals, um, you know, slugs, insects. Um, you know, they all they're a very important part of um, the whole ecosystem. So, like the use of insecticides and you know, many fertilizers, uh, they may produce a fantastic crop of something or other, but at, at a, a truly terrible expense. So I think we maybe just need to rethink our gardening and our planting and our forestry and all of these things. Um, and certainly it's interesting, like I think it, it can be helpful to contemplate also the practices of native peoples, like the Aboriginal peoples, the Native American Indians um, and yeah, other other. Um, people who've lived closer to nature and who depended on nature, depended on the animals, you know, for food, um, and to see their sense of themselves as actually part of nature and um, an enormous respect and gratitude um, for, like, the food that they received and the shelter that they received and never to, to harm or to take things without um, a sense of gratitude, a sense of respect and an, a, an awareness of what they were doing. So I think, you know, we can attune to nature in a way that um, even though we sometimes may, uh, through our enthusiasm, um, harm, you know, a worm or a slug or a caterpillar or an aphid, um, or some other creature, um, that we to, just to really know that we're not doing it deliberately. So there's a sense of uh, regret. I wish I wish that hadn't happened. I wish I hadn't done that. Um, and as far as possible, to find alternative strategies. Now, sometimes you simply can't. You know, like um, you know, there are sometimes situations where you, where you have to kill things, but really to do one's best to not kid anything. Um, so there's no easy answer to these things. And it's really up to each person to, to find a way. Um, but for us as like Buddhist practitioners to really see the importance of intention. So here at Amrawati, the gardening is not because we want to slaughter hundreds of worms or caterpillars or butterflies or insects or whatever, but it's because to maintain um, a, a beautiful garden, um, beautiful surroundings, you know, a contemplative uh, monastic atmosphere rather than a jungle. Like if you, you know, it's, it's interesting to notice what happens if you don't tend yeah. a space, you know, I, I'm interested to notice here, you know, and also up at Miltu, you know, if we left the garden untended for even even just a year, you know, these these plants are very um, they want to live and they they multiply like crazy. You know, yeah. so we, we would have a, a dense forest <laughs> um, in no time at all. So it's it's finding a balance and doing the best we can and. Um, uh, just knowing that our intention is not to cause harm, but our intention is rather to create a beautiful environment and to support nature as far as possible. So slightly changing our attitude about uh, our garden. Uh, we've started, we have a, a like a wildflower meadow uh, on the back lawn. It's a, quite a big lawn at Milne Hume at the back and it's rather boring and not much happening and so I decided just to let let it grow and to to plant poppies and um, other kinds of wild flowers there and uh, that, that brings a lot of delight and also brings a lot of insects uh, and of course feeds the birds which is another aspect of this food chain business. So these are just a few reflections the reason I mean if you look into the rules actually about digging the soil and uh, cutting trees and cutting plants, that they are quite strange. I can't actually remember the, the whole story about why monks can't cut trees, but it, 
something to do with um, a tree spirit who was harmed and was so angry with the monk that she was going to actually cause harm to him. And I think she went to the Buddha and said, because the Buddha used to talk to these devas and said, no, you mustn't do that. And also talked to the monk and said, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have cut that tree. You shouldn't have damaged that tree. And then he made a rule about monks or, or, or bhikkhunis, you know, damaging plant life. Um, but for Siladara, which is a slightly different ordination, we, we, we can damage plant life. Um, but we try to do it, um, you know, in as conscious a way as possible and respectful a way as possible as well. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is very helpful. Uh, just, uh, I'm at the moment reorganizing, restructuring my garden. It's very, very small, but there are some old plants yeah. that don't look very happy now. And they, they have to go elsewhere. Yes, yeah, yeah. Everything, everything that's born dies, and plants kind of come to an end at some stage, or you can pass them on to somebody else. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I don't think they'll mind if you do it kindly. You know, they'll just become part of the soil, and that'll be good for the soil. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's a great help. <laughs> Can I ask something related? Yes. <coughs> I was um, a book for a human library event uh, on uh, at the weekend, and someone came along, and uh, my, my title was a uh, uh, Buddhist chaplain, and uh, someone came along and said, "I know there is a rebirth in Buddhism. Can you become a plant in your next one?" And uh, I was caught <laughs> off guard. <coughs> Couldn't actually think of what uh, Orthodox uh, Buddhism uh, states on that subject. Could you elucidate? Uh, well, the brief answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't know. I really don't know. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, I enjoy hearing people who really know about these things talking about rebirth um i do i do find it interesting but we're in in our in our kind of um lineage we're not really encouraged to think too much about that um obviously to to live carefully and responsibly so that there's a chance that we might have a, a fortunate rebirth rather than uh, land up in some ghastly hell realm um, so to try to live our lives you know, carefully and responsibly. Um, but the rebirth that is more interesting to us is the moment-by-moment -moment rebirth, you know, to really investigate that. that that's, that's what's of real interest and concern. That's what's really useful to, to investigate because that supports us um, in liberating the heart, in letting go moment-by-moment. -moment. So understanding the grasping that leads us into a future rebirth and more and more learning how to let go so that there's, we, we, we um, like the Buddha himself, like when he was fully enlightened and the Arahants, you know, they, they were not going to be reborn even in a moment by moment kind of way because they had let go of any attachment or investment in what they did. They simply responded to the conditions as they experienced them. So, um, I don't know whether I'll be reborn as a tree or a plant, but possibly, maybe an insect. I don't know, maybe a deva. Don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> People love to ask these kind of questions. They do, yeah. <laughs> but it's all right to say you don't know. Thank you. Is there anything else anybody would like to ask? Well, maybe I have one minute to eight. Maybe we'll um, 
Shall we? Would it be very difficult to organize the um, Buddha's words on loving kindness in English? I think it's on page 36. Um, and then after that, we could do the closing homage, which I think is on page uh, 16. Brilliant, lovely, lovely. I think that would be a, a nice reflection for us. And then we'll, we'll, we'll do the closing homage after that. <clears throat> this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. And we'll do the closing homage now. <clears throat> The Lord, the perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. The Blessed One's disciples who have practiced well, 
I bow to the sun. Imogen, I don't know if you'd like to say a few closing words. A few closing words. Um, well, just thank you very much for all being here this, this evening. It's been very lovely to spend time with you all. Um, some of you may know Ajahn Sundara, who quite often teaches these classes. And just to say that uh, she probably won't be teaching, at least for a while. She's not being well. She had a heart attack a few weeks ago, just a small one, but um, she's now needing to rest quite a lot. And um, I'm sure um, she would send her, her best wishes if she knew I was here teaching you all right now, definitely. And um, it's just, she's making a very good recovery. So that's, that's very good news in a way. And um, I really would like to encourage you just to keep continuing with your practice. Uh, don't forget the precepts and if possible, try to have some time each day where you sit quietly and just do your best to be present. It doesn't have to be um, all the jhanas and everything else. I mean, lovely if you can do that, but uh, just, just being present uh, in a kind and friendly way with yourself. Now that's already a, a significant support for yourself in your, in your daily life. And who knows the effect on those around you. So I do wish you well. Thank you.